Yeah. Thank you. Listen, this talk has three sections. The first is about culture. The second is about the corporation. And the third is about how we get the culture, how we get culture into the corporation. Um, so what I want to do, well, just to start, these last three weeks have been the opening of the fall season for, for television. So I'm guessing all of you have seen some new shows return, some old shows returned, and you've seen some, uh, some new shows. Um, this, uh, w when we talk about culture, when an anthropologist talks about culture, what you're looking at is a fantastic degree of innovation and dynamism and, and creativity. When uh, John F. Kennedy asked a guy called Minow to have a look at TV and to assess its impact on American culture, Minow thought long and hard, uh, he was an opera lover, um, and uh, he looked at uh, American TV in the early 60s and said, you know what, this is a wasteland. And if you let it, TV will turn American culture into a wasteland. And here we are, roughly 50 years later, looking at a TV that's impossibly productive of innovation and creativity. We just take the example of HBO, which, uh, what, in, in 94 was a was an obscure play in the world of television, and 10 years later was suddenly a juggernaut producing the shows we know and love, Six Feet Under and, and The Sopranos and so on. The Emmys of uh, 2004 were, were, was its moment of triumph, and, and they took all the awards, and they put the rest of the industry on notice that TV would never be the same. Um, that's one indication of just how dynamic this culture can be. Even the parts of our culture that we believe to be wastelands prove to be productive. But the sheer dynamism of culture is a problem for the corporation. And we can take one case in point here in the case of uh, television. We look at NBC. In the last few years, has struggled desperately to get a handle on how to do new shows, how to, how to, how to draw inspiration from the, the HBO example. Uh, and and they, NBC's done so badly for so long that Jeff Zucker, as you know, just left, was fired effectively by Comcast uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we'll see what happens next. But that too, I think, is kind of interesting for our purposes. It says that uh, the corporation sometimes has a hard time getting a handle on the, 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 corpor the, the culture of which it is a part. This is a little uh, restaurant created in Berkeley in, uh, in 1973 by Alice Waters. It's called Chez Panisse. When it was created, it was one of hundreds of thousands of restaurants were created that year in, uh, in, the, uh, in the US, tens of thousands created in California. Uh, this little restaurant, in fact, proved to be a laboratory for change, creating new concepts of slow food and new approaches to food and new approaches to the, the growing and production of food. It grew, it proved to be so influential that just last year, Michelle Obama put a vegetable garden on the lawn of the White House. And we can draw an absolute connection between what Alice Waters was doing in Berkeley in 73 and what Michelle, Michelle Obama was doing at the White House last year. This is a, a slide that shows Obama taking a tour of the, vegetable, of the vegetable garden. So we're a culture that allows innovations to take place everywhere. And that's one of the big, that's the really big news is that innovation is no longer the work of elites sitting in a few cities. It, it, it can be undertaken, it can be accomplished anywhere. And then some of those innovations can actually be allowed to influence the mainstream, in this case, the lawn of the White House. I mean, as an anthropologist, I have to tell you, this is astonishing. Um, when Levi Strauss went to Australia to talk to them about how they were managing after World War II, when the tribal structure, the Aboriginal world had been exploded by the effects of World War II, everybody um, in the Aboriginal community was collected and put outside big cities. So Levi Strauss went in and said, so, you know, how bad is it? And they said, well, what do you mean? And he said, your world's been turned upside down. The social, the fundamentals of your social organization have been, have been, have been overturned. And they said, well, no, actually, we reworked the whole tribal and mythic structure, and within a couple of generations, no one will know that we've not always lived this, in this place, in this way. We just reworked 
all of the, we, we re-engineered our social organization. That's what traditional cultures do. They resist change, and when change happens, they make sure that change is, is prevented from having structural effects. That's not what we do. We let people create restaurants in Northern California, and then we let those restaurants have an influence on the lawn of the White House. <clears throat> Here's how we made food in after World War II. I always think there's um, grounds for suspicion here. The fact that the helmets are actually the same color as the, the meat on the assembly line is a little off-putting, and I wouldn't be entirely surprised to discover that they're made of roughly the same materials. But, but so this is the way we thought about This was not uh, you know, an appalling image in its, in its day. Um, it certainly is now. Indeed, we so transformed our approach to food that we take an artisanal approach, and here we see a book dedicated to the proposition that food should be crafted by hand, not treated as an industrial um, um, production, but crafted every meal, every substance within the meal crafted by hand. So um, even the fundamental terms of our culture can be overturned. Here's the hardware store as it existed. This was one of the great bulwarks. This resisted cultural innovation of every kind. You could go to a hardware store until quite recently, and you could get any color of white paint you wanted as long as it was this color of white paint, right? I mean, it really was, would have, this is a place that would have made Henry Ford deeply, deeply happy. But even, you know, and it was the place that had hammers and a practical male kind of domain where people didn't fiddle around with fat or fashion. Um, or so some people said. And here's where it is now. This is a, a sheet from, this is a tiny subsection of the number of paints you can get from Sherwin and Williams. And in fact, this, you know, there are about 300 uh, shades of paint you can get from Sherwin and Williams, and, and many of them turn over with, with some frequency. So we're seeing just an explosive, the, the culture that was seen to be a wasteland, that treated food as a production, a pr um, an industrial production, um, has in fact become uh, a home for fantastic invention. And it's a challenge for the corporation. I mean, another lesson I think we could draw from the explosive creativity that we've seen coming from TV is that that's a creativity that came from the corporate world. You know, that wasn't artists working on the, on the, on the, on the, uh, in the avant-garde, on the far margin of our culture. That was people all of them, you know, working very hard to, to speak to popular tastes, even as they created this extraordinarily inventive cultural stuff. So the corporation has risen to the occasion on, on more than one occasion, and, uh, but not always. And uh, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about a moment when I was in a little uh, avant-garde neighborhood um, in Montreal called Saint Laurent, and it's, you know, hipsterville. Um, to a, to a T, and some guy pulls up in a Hummer, and he gets out and he's kind of strutting around like, you know, see how glorious I am. I mean, check out my wheels, first of all, and then, you know, you can reach your own conclusions. Obviously, I'm a marvelous person. <laughs> and it was great to see Mont Montrealers just, at least the people on these sidewalks as this guy pulled up, just froze him out. I mean, he's just sort of strutting around, looking for attention, and everyone just pretended he wasn't there, and then they began to give off this kind of extraordinary degree of hostility. And the guy eventually, you could see him, kind of, you know, he wasn't the brightest spark in the world, but he, he, could, he could spot hostility when he saw it, and he picked it up from the crowd and thought, okay, great, thank you very much, and he got in the car and, you know, pulled away. And I thought, boy, the corporation sometimes acts like this guy. You know, and all of it, or not all of us, but some of us have worked for the corporation, for corporations which in their day, and this is still true for certain purposes, the corporation acts, um, is so large and so powerful, it creates its own weather patterns. You know, it has its own gravitational field. It can bend the world, and it does bend the world to its will. And sometimes I think that encourages us a, a, a kind of arrogance that, 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 that works very badly now that culture is so productive and so distributed and so unpredictable. To make matters worse, the corporation isn't very interested in all of our complexity. Each of us is the person we, we take to work every day, but we're also enthusiasts in, in the world of music, or, or we may indeed make our own music, 
We're interested in all kinds of movies. We know about all kinds of culture, but the corporation doesn't want to hear about that when we come to work, which is to say the corporation has these fantastic resources of cultural intelligence. Sitting there in the mailroom is a guy who knows all about whatever he knows about. Um, he's an expert in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I mean, he knows that corpus, you know, episode by episode. And he, but more important, he knows how it reshaped the sensibility of teenagers in its moment. Uh, but nobody ever consults him on that basis, which seems to me a, a problem. This is the one that, of course, we're com com really comfortable with, and it's the notion that the consumer has become a kind of producer, that people now control the means of cultural production. And this is, uh, I took this in Connecticut. It's one of my neighbors, a high school student, I think, who uh, gave us a Dorian Gray portrait of the real Donald Trump. Right? She's giving us the, the man she knows him to be. Uh, and that's the active producer, no longer the couch potato, no, no longer waiting for corporate influence or commercial messages, now just taking control of culture and inventing it for uh, their own purposes. So I'm doing uh, ethnographic interviews for a big brand, and I'm talking to a respondent who says, finally, we've been talking for about an hour about how, what, how brands work in her life, and she says, finally, you know what it's like? talking about a particular brand. She said, this brand is kind of like that guy at a party who's had too much to drink, and he's talking too loudly, and he won't let anybody get a word in edgewise, and he's really obnoxious, and you can just watch the crowd kind of begin to, to move away from him. And uh, I think, you know, the corporation, for some purposes, and some cor corporations for all purposes, runs the risk of finding itself isolated, talking to itself in the, the new culture we're looking at. So what I want to do, oh, so and then the question is, well, does the corporation fully get uh, what's happened here? Does it understand what it means to live in a culture that now has these new structural properties? And uh, some corporations do, some don't. But certainly the people who write the books to advise the corporation on strategic matters get what's happened absolutely. These are the titles of recent uh, books published by the business presses and blown to bits and out of control and creative destruction and, and faster and blur and age of paradox. Um, the guru, so-called, uh, understand that the world now churns with a dynamism and an instability that we've never seen before. I believe that these titles have a whiff of panic about them because we're not so good at understanding the dynamism that comes from culture. Dynamism has many sources, and one of them is just the sheer press of technology and the fact that we created an internet and then began to use that inter internet for, for every purpose. But it also comes from culture, and some of the panic we see in these titles, I think, can be made to go away to the extent that we begin to get a handle on what culture is. So here are five steps. There's just a few, a few suggestions kind of thing just to aid the conversation. Um, one of the things I think we're inclined to do when we look at contemporary culture is just treat the latest stuff. It's the latest music, the latest movies and stuff like that. And what we tend not to do is take seriously what I think is our larger, for those of us interested in this topic, our larger professional obligation is to be really scholarly and thoughtful and well informed about this. So that when we're talking about music in the present day, we should have a clear sense uh, when, this is Robert Johnson, you know, one of the creators of Delta Blues and the man who sold his soul to the devil to learn to play the guitar. Um, we should know about this guy when we're talking about contemporary music. And, and our discussions of contemporary culture should always be informed by this deeper understanding of American, of American culture. Um, too often when we, when we talk about culture and the culture the corporation needs to keep track of, we're just talking about the latest things. We're talking about what the cool hunters bring us. And that's maybe just 20% of what we need to be tracking. And it is the froth, it's the churn that's hardest to think about. Once we get the lower, the depths, the foundations of contemporary culture, we understand that froth, that churn, very much better than we do now. Because otherwise, it's, you know what it's like. Right, if you follow contemporary music, or um, it's just like standing in a wind tunnel. There's just innovation coming from everywhere, and you just have this sense of hydroplaning. You know, you think, geez. Well, uh, David and I were talking about pattern recognition. You think, 
you have moments of pattern recognition. You also have moments you just think no pat patterns are no longer possible. So if we get these depths, I think we're well served. One of the problems with keeping track of culture is that you know those websites, um, they tell us, they give us the, the new trends. And you log in every day and they give you 20 or 50 or 100 new trends. And they never go back to them. So you'll hear about something and then it's like a little blip on the radar and then it's gone. And you have no, and what we don't do is track things over time. Um, I had a student at uh, Harvard Business School who's now um, managing a big stock fund. And so I said, tell me how you do it. And what was really, for me, instructive was the absolute discipline and rigor with which he examines uh, all of his decisions and the care with which he looks for the assumptions he was making, not just when he was wrong, that's when it really counts, but when he was right. So he can account for any given decision at any given moment. He can tell you what he was thinking and what his intellectual mindset looked like. It seems to me we'd be well served by maps of culture. You can think of them as weather maps or air traffic control arrays, visual displays that, that allow us to talk about, that allow us to pick up something like Alice's Waters innovation in Berkeley in 73 and track it as it comes to, to the vegetable garden of the, of the White House. That we wanna, we wanna, at any given moment, we want to have a, a sense of all the stuff that's moving so that when we sit down to that daily read of all the trends that are happening, we can say, oh yeah, we know what that is. We're tracking that. Or that's just, we're pretty sure that's noise because nothing else in this problem set confirms its importance. <clears throat> what I'm hoping is uh, that somebody will build one of these build big boards, I'm calling them. I have to think of a, another term. But I was talking to a big Japanese company uh, uh, last week, and uh, next week I'm going to be talking to a big English uh, company, and, uh, and somebody's going to build one of these, you know, it's going to look like one of these heavens. In fact, we can think about these individual lights as trends moving, you know, and we, we can track it, we can run it, we can say this is, this is how it's changed over the last two weeks. We can bring clients in and we can say, look, he, here's, he, here are the things we believe matter to you, and here are the trends that are now converging growing or, or failing as they, as they reshape the world in which you want to compete. So these things are possible and uh, I think they'd be thrilling to have that handle because otherwise it's that terrible sense of hydroplaning. It's that sense of, oh my God, endless, uh, reckless change. Let's just see if I can, there we go. What we really need here are more metrics. <clears throat> you know, and I'm trained as a, a qualitative guy, as an anthropologist, and I'm happy to do things you know, uh, on the back of an envelope, and, and, and for a long time in my career, I didn't take metrics uh, seriously, but uh, w there's so much moving out there. These heavens, to keep track of them without numbers and without metrics and without measures, it's tr truly, I now get, I get that it's now absolutely impossible. I, since, uh, I don't, uh, th there are some students at MIT who had this fantastically interesting idea for gathering metrics. They put cameras in trees all over Cambridge and the cameras are only capable of capturing the color of people's clothing. And they can give you a map of who, what colors were being worn in Cambridge at any given time, and they can run the map so that you can see co colors coming and going. So green suddenly appears, and it starts to take over Cambridge. And it's there in the Harvard side of Cambridge, but it's not there in the MIT side of Cambridge. Well, a, you, you won't be surprised to learn that a lot of fashions never get to the MIT part of <laughs> Cambridge. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but there it is, you know, and, it, and nobody really cares about how students dress in, in, uh, in Cambridge, but imagine having cameras like this in a fashion forward neighborhood in Paris that you really care about if you're Burberry and, and you've placed ads in the Vogue, the Paris Vogue, and uh, you want to know whether it took. And this is your map to see. It, it did take, and look, it's growing, it's spreading through Paris. It'd be fantastically useful. So these metrics are, are critical. Um, we know that generations X and Y have embraced popular culture with real passion, um, and uh, we need to draw that cultural knowledge out of them with, with new acuity. As it is, uh, those generations are sitting around playing buzzword bingo because they feel unengaged by, and who can blame them, right? We carry on conversations without a sophisticated understanding of culture, and so, uh, it's, it's quite right that they should be using what Clay Shirky calls their, their cognitive surplus for, for these 
purposes. We want this data built into to what we do. And finally, I think we want to break the glass ceiling. We know that women have, have suffered a glass ceiling that's kept them out of the C-suite. I would argue that people who know and care about culture have been kept out of the C-suite in some of the same ways. And we want to, we want to, break, that, uh, we want to break that barrier. And with that, I'll, I'll close. Thank you for your attention.